morning. This is Jeremiah. It's J-Man Monero, J-Man Seminars with Millennial Who Talks, episode number 20, lucky 2-0 today. And we're here with Alexa Caballo-Hughes. We're, we're doing Millennial Who Talks here where we're changing lives with inspiring stories from real estate rock stars from across the country. And she's coming to us from Connecticut today. But before we get started, if you're watching this and you hear any little bit of little nugget of information where you like what you hear, you'd like to share it with somebody, please tag them in the comments. Share the live feed if you want to, or if you want to subscribe. Hey man. Oh, it's a great day for real estate, like we say, right? <laughs> That's it. It's not a snow day like last week. Back to so, work. Let's get started with your story. Just tell us, you know, a little bit about who you are, where you're from, you know, how you got started in real estate. What does DOB mean? And uh, you know. Yeah. So if you if you didn't get if you didn't get it, DOB is not date of birth. It's actually daughter of a broker. So that's actually how I got my start in real estate. Um, in fact, I went to UConn, had no idea what I wanted to do. I actually always was around the family business. We have tons of entrepreneurs in our family. And, um, you know, after going to UConn, finding out that I don't want a cookie cutter job. I did an internship with my mother and was totally hooked. As soon as I graduated, got my license, and I've been a practicing realtor since 2011, full time. Overtime. So I'm I'm glad that you mentioned that because like a lot of many young people these days that go to college and it's like, yeah, I'm going to college. What are you going for? Ah, I'm going to college. You know, like they don't really know what they want to do. And it, it's, it's great that you at least you did an internship before you went into the family business and discovered that you loved it. And your mom didn't really say like, Alexa, you're getting into the family business, right? That's uh -huh. kind of what you wanted to do. A hundred percent. In fact, you know, it was never even a discussion of you should join the family business or anything to that degree. And it actually kind of just happened naturally. I was always the, the go-to person my mother would call, like whenever she had ideas and whatnot, she actually became the broker, a bunch of merges and acquisitions. And I was kind of always right there to kind of, you know, chat with her. She's my best friend. And then finally, after having an internship with the Department of Banking for the government, I realized I absolutely want nothing to do with any type of corporate <laughs> setting. So that's when I had an internship with her brokerage, was the front desk person. And by the way, I was so timid. I was so shy. When I when that front desk phone rang, I was scared shitless, if you know what I mean. Like I was like, what am yeah. I gonna say? What am I gonna do? And you know, it's funny how things evolve and you know, being able to see all the realtors and their elements and what they're doing and helping people. I realized this is what I want to do. The sky's the limit. No ceiling, no floor. So let's talk about shyness because you're, you're not that anymore. I would, I mean, some people are shy for life, but then they find a way to overcome it. Tell me how, like in that, when you started as the intern, you're answering the phones, like what did you do to help you overcome your fears and your shyness and all that? So you just kind of did it every day or what? Yeah. So, I mean, that's a great question. My mother, you know, she has the vision and mission of our company and all that. And one of the key principles is get comfortable with being uncomfortable, either rise into your potential or sink into your comfort zone. And I kind of lived by that because my parents always told me, listen, no matter what you're going through in life, everyone else is in the same shoes as you. Everyone else is, you know, uncomfortable. So why not just make the most of it? Any opportunity that's come my way since then I essentially, I guess you could say fake it till you make it or just essentially just put your best foot forward and actions speak louder than words. And before you know it, trial and error, you know, I'm not perfect to this day. I'm not perfect, but it's kind of just putting yourself out there, taking any opportunity that comes your way and making it into your own. So I want to be sure I got this right. Rise to your potential or sink into your comfort zone. Is that right? Yeah. Yep. All right, I'm gonna put this up on the screen because that's yep. that's a good one. So guys, I can't say I didn't make that one up. I was actually in my Peloton bike the other day, and that's what the coach was screaming to us. And I was like, This is amazing. It's <laughs> so know? amazing. Rise to your potential sink into your comfort zone. Yeah. And and I do also like, you know, get comfortable being uncomfortable because that's my mom's you're doing something new. And if, yeah, if you're not into some kind of if you've never been in sales before, then it's it's a it's a different animal. You know, you gotta Sure. Talk to people. Somebody might say no and somebody might reject you. God forbid, you know, it's somebody like might tell you no. no, you know, if you're comfortable in what you're doing, if you're not at least a little bit uncomfortable, you're not growing. You know, you have to feel that, um, you know, 
that sense of this is like a little bit new or this is something mm -hmm. different or I feel like, you know, a little this, bit scary. yeah, that's when you really see the benefit. And that's kind of what I've lived by. So how did you transition from the front desk then? Did you just say, okay, look, I love this. I'm going to get licensed. And what happened from there? hundred percent. So, um, yeah, I was the front desk person that my last quarter of, or my last um, semester at school. And I had my major consumer behavior, which was business psychology, sociology, and communications. Because there wasn't just nice. a study at UConn I wanted. I'm like, I need to make my own major because there's just way too much out there, you know? So, um, <laughs> and of course, we know how psychology and communications and sociology fits perfectly with real estate. Often we're, okay. you know, we're there for all their, their different chapters of life. But anyways, I did that internship and realized this is totally what I want. Right after I graduated, went to the real estate school, got licensed uh, that September. I haven't turned back. And so did you just, did you hit the ground running? Was it a challenge at first? You know, I know having your mom and having a great mentor, coach, broker, all in one is awesome. Like how did, how did you ramp up your business in the beginning? Like what challenges did you face? How did you overcome them? Great question. So, I mean, I got licensed in September and by the end of that year, I did 13 transactions my first full year, which is not bad, you know? Um, yeah. And a lot of it came from the internet leads. I worked the internet leads. I was 22 years old. So, I mean, the average first time home buyer is what, 31? So I was working with people that were older than me. I was working with a lot of people that, you know, I've never even bought or, or, or sold a home personally. So it's kind of like, and, and I also was pulling up to appointments in a really crappy car. <laughs> so it's kind of like you, you put yourself out there and you really just try to say to yourself, I know that I will have my client's best interest in mind a thousand percent. I may not know everything yet, but guess what? I'm going to find out the answers. I may not have the most experience, but I have other agents to lean on. Not only my mother, but I also picked out key other, key other agents and actually asked them to be my mentor. And, you know, really, really, um, you know, was upfront with that. And I believe that you are, you know, a combination of the five people closest to you. So make sure you're spending your time with people that kind of drive you to succeed and have those same, those same, you know, uh, those same, the same drive. Um, and that's something that I was never really too intimidated about. I realized that, you know what, one day I'm going to be in their shoes and I would appreciate it if someone reached out to me. I think Judy said in one of her interviews uh, with you, uh, her episode that she actually would specifically find mentors and whatnot and, you know, ask agents if they need help and all that. Um, and I found that to be a really, really good way to learn. So I always tell people, don't be afraid. If you see someone that you like what they're doing um, to try to link up with them. And in mm -hmm. fact, other, other agent referrals um, are 20% of my business. I did, I did my little uh, year over year stats. And so 20% of my business last year was specifically from either other agents in other parts of Connecticut or other agents from other areas. And I have a lot of agents that are kind of phasing out of the business. There are maybe 57, 58, the average realtor that I'm kind of linking up with. So all those key things really, really do come into play. So what's your strategy for that? Getting the agent referrals. Talk a little bit about that. Like you meet an agent, you get their card, like, What's that relationship like? How do you develop that relationship so that you can get referrals in the future? Yeah, so great question. So I pretty much approach it the same way that I approach anytime I'm working with a buyer or seller. 97% of my business is by referral. Um, and I really make it you know, well known to my clients that listen, I do not prospect for new business. All I focus on is you and making sure that you have the best experience possible. And all I ask is that if you like the service I give, you think of me when you, know, you come across someone look, make, looking to make a move. And I kind of took that same approach anytime I go to a conference or anytime I'm networking in my association, I make it very clear, you know, I kind of learn who they are, where they're from. And if I don't have someone in that area, I'm pretty upfront. And I say, listen, I don't have someone in your area. I will I would love to make you my go-to. Do you have your go-to for Connecticut? And then a lot of times they say, no, I don't actually. Like, I would love for you to be my go-to person. And I tell them, like, listen, even if you're not sure what area of Connecticut I may work, like I work mostly central Connecticut. If I don't personally service that area, I will make sure that I get you connected with the best agent that will service them. And that's kind of opened up the door, you know, kind of being that go-to source that we try to be. Yeah, I really like that. I think some people have 
the wrong strategy if they go to a conference and they're trying to collect as many business cards as possible. And I heard somebody say this in an interview recently, you know, it's about quality, not quantity, where I'd rather talk to five, maybe 10 people at a conference, develop those relationships, have that conversation, like you're saying, do you have somebody where I'm at? No, well, let's work together and just know that I'd provide a great service. So I think that's that's awesome. 100%. In fact, I'm visiting one of my uh, key, you know, friends I've made, actually. I mean, you really make great relationships with these people. I'm actually visiting Kinsey down in Fort Myers uh, in the month of February, you know, right before I have a little conference to go to. So it's really nice. And I get to see her and her brokerage, let's see what she's done. Maybe I'll teach a class for her. <clears throat> and she's taught me so much along the way. It's all about kind of sharing and rising each other up. And that, and I, you brought that up when you're in another area to visit each other's brokerages. Like I do that all the time. And I just, it's so exciting just to go to another office, see how they work, see what, you know, get an idea of this is their workspace every day. It helps you to really just take the relationship to the next level. You're more like, you're more than a, a business relationship at that point. It's like your friends, you know, it's like you. you and yeah. friends understand each other more than anyone else that's not in the industry. <laughs> 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 exactly. But let's talk about your strategy for like with the internet, internet leads when you were working those in the beginning. How, what was your approach like? I know there's so many different approaches and I know there's going to be new agents watching this that maybe that's the only way they, they can generate business in the beginning of their career. You know, how did, how did you do it? A hundred percent. So, I mean, as I mentioned prior, the average realtor is 57 years old, right? And not to say age matters, but a lot of things have changed for these agents over the years. And I feel that my opportunity was the fact that I took these internet leads seriously, whereas a lot of people that I've run into, they're like, are these leads even real? And I kind of share with them, they're legit. <laughs> I've closed these leads. Uh, but the thing, the hard thing you have to remember is, I mean, everyone's searching online. You have to have your online presence. And by the way, if you don't respond to these internet leads within five minutes, they're gone. So what I've done actually through, um, I have the five sheets, five street system through uh, my Remax um, portal is one of my benefits. And I know you can purchase five street on your own as well. But what I've done is I have actually created an auto responder. So by the way, I can't be available 24 seven when I'm with clients. I'm trying not to answer my phone, of course, unless it's an emergency. When I'm driving, I don't want to be texting to respond to a lead, of course. Uh, we have to be very cognizant of that. So what I've done was I set up an autoresponder. And instead of just saying, you know, I'm with clients right now, I'll get back to you as soon as possible. In that text, I also included a link to a bomb bomb video where I recorded, hi, my name's Alexa Cavallo Hughes with the Remax Edge. Uh, so sorry, I'm actually with other clients right now or an appointment. However, I'll get back to you as soon as possible. And I noticed my conversion has gone up dramatically uh, and drastically based on the fact that they were able to get a face of the name now the consumers realize that, you know what, there really is a person on the other side of that, you know, inquiry. And I find that even if I'm not able to get back to them in a very, very timely manner, you know, at least they have the initial and I can get back to them once I'm done with my appointment. And I feel as though at that point, they're not going to be searching elsewhere online and inquiring on other websites because they've already kind of seen, oh, she's a real person. She is going to get back to me. I love that you mentioned video so that we can segue right into one of my favorite things on the planet <laughs> talking about video. So how do you use video in your business? You integrate it with bomb bomb. We've heard that bomb is a great tool and that's bomb bomb.com. If you're watching, they have a free trial. You can go on there. Not um, but if you do the free trial, do the free trial. What's that Alexa? No, I said it just, just so people know it's not boom, boom.com. Someone had said that to me before. <laughs> that, that may send you somewhere entirely different that will not be real estate related. I figured we'd, make, we'd have to make that clear. Sorry to cut you off. I couldn't help myself. Yeah, no, it's bombbomb.com. They have free trials available. I think it's a two-week free trial. If you're going to do it, do it. Like, don't just say, oh, I got it. I didn't, I didn't like it. And it's because you didn't use it. Make That's sure it. you use it. So let's, right. let's, talk, let's talk about how you're using it in your business. Totally. So let's start with bomb bomb. I mean, so I've been going to... I, I always believe in continuing education and always, always, you know, putting yourself out there, learning more, et cetera, right? So I've been going to the Remax International Conference since I've been an agent, so since 2012. And I remember from the very first time I went there, they were talking about, you need to get into video. And everyone's like, look at each other, like, what do we do? This is so scary and new. And then finally, you know, that was six years ago, by the way. So finally, about three years ago, I was like, you know what? I'm just going to get bomb bomb. And by the way, 
you have to use it, right? So I've been able to kind of implement it not only on like a uh, case to case scenario. So example, let's say that I want to follow up with one of these agents I've met at the conferences. I'll send out a nice little bomb bomb, say, you know, hey, Jay, man, it was so great to meet you. I look forward to doing business and never hesitate to reach out, blah, blah, blah. And people love that human touch. Not to mention the fact that I find that doing um, using video instead of typing up an email is not only 10 times more effective, my clients love it. They get they really understand kind of what you're relaying to them because it's like face to face, as close to face to face as you can get. But also it's actually uh, saving me tons of time for me to comprise an email that may take five minutes now takes literally 60 seconds or however long it takes for me to record the video. So I find that to be really, really incredible. Next, I also am also working on templates because we a lot of times we have the same templated responses that we're in this stage of the transaction, yada, yada. So instead of just including the typical verbiage I include, I'm now going to be accompanying that with a video kind of specifying you're in this stage of the transaction. This is what you're supposed to anticipate. So it's kind of creating systems that work for work for you, kind of creating the machine that makes the machine in a sense. And <laughs> Um, so that's just one application. I also use BombBomb Bomb as far as I set up auto reminders that go out anytime that it's like a, a home anniversary of my clients or happy birthday. That's one thing that I'm going to be doing this year. Um, in addition to, I have the BombBomb Bomb prompt account where once a month they help you kind of get together a bunch of content um, with links. Like this is the, the top topic of one month was this is everything you need to know about smart homes. And I'll record a little segment. They actually kind of tell you what you could say. And then it really helps with engagement. So I've kind of pushed aside my former like ways of doing newsletters and mailings. And I just kind of put out this relevant, cool content once a month through Bomb Bomb. So what what's the message you have for people who are afraid of video? You know, there's so many people out there that are like, ah, oh, I don't like my face or I don't like my voice, you know, like what's the message for them? I love that. It's true. I mean, people, we, people have to remember, it's not about you. It's not about how you look like, this is how I look when you meet me. Like, this is how I sound like get over it. You know what I mean? And I, what I tell people is you're going to have to do it eventually. You're either going to have, have to evolve to what, to what the common practice is going to be, which is video, or you're going to go extinct. So you don't want to be a dinosaur evolve or go extinct. So why not be at the cutting edge of it all? Just start doing video while they have no one else to compare to. There's not many people in the marketplace doing this. So just do it and you will get all the benefit of it. You'll get out there being one of the first doing it in your marketplace. Maybe the second or third, doesn't matter. Versus re realizing you have to do it a year or two from now. So it's kind of inevitable. So I would say just do it. Believe me, the first time I ever did Facebook, and that's something I want to talk about as well, I do a lot of Facebook lives. And the first time I did that, I did a Facebook live virtual open house. First of all, I was literally like, I couldn't sleep for two weeks because I was so nervous. Second of all, my hand was shaking so much, but luckily I have this little DJI Osmo mobilized with like SETI cam that you put the phone in. So thankfully people can see my hand shaking so much. But anyways, again, it goes back to my original, you know, rise into your potential or, or fall into your comfort zone just do it you'll 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 really you'll really see how it impacts your business and in fact just doing the facebook lives like facebook live virtual open houses that's just one avenue of what i use facebook live for i also use it to do interviews of my top vendors i also use it to do a market update i've actually had it uh record and um record me do a presentation facebook live presentation on how's the market with slides to my BNI business networking international group in which, you know, a lot of people were able to kind of see, wow, this is, this girl knows her stuff, you know? So mm -hmm. use, use Facebook live, use video to kind of be a tool to broadcast the things that you may already be doing. I know people do buyer seminars, seller seminars. I honestly haven't gotten too much into that. However, I have done a buyer seminar uh, specifically to 203K, so rehab financing. I included yep, yep. myself, a lender that specializes in that, the number one rental lender in Connecticut and in, in the East Coast, a HUD consultant and a contractor uh, and an attorney. And we kind of have this panel going through, you know, the opportunities of 203K. So you can use Facebook Live 
in so many different avenues, as I mentioned. So, so what kind of what quick, kind of quick tips? Oh, hold on, hold on. I'm getting some, getting feedback, some feedback a little bit. Now I can lower myself. Yeah. All right. So, what kind of just quick top five tips would you give somebody for streaming video? Because they're like, oh my gosh, I'm scared to just record myself doing a regular video. Now I have to go live. What if I make a mistake? What if I say the wrong thing? What, what if I don't know what I'm going to say? Like, how yeah. do you handle all that stress? And uh, like, how do you plan ahead of time? Or how do you, you know, what do you plan your agenda ahead of time? Or do you just wing it? Like, what, what's your approach? Because I've heard <laughs> all different kinds. <laughs> all right. So what I always remind myself first and foremost is if you don't like the presentation, like whatever you're broadcasting on live, you can stop it and you can delete it and it will never be seen again. That's number one. And by the way, like the most views that you get is after the fact, after you post it to remain on your page. So remind yourself, yeah, you know what? Maybe five or six people saw you maybe mess up. But if it's really that bad, which I bet it's not going to be that bad. <laughs> if it's really that bad, you can just stop it, delete it, never to be seen again. That's number one. Number two, yeah, you want to you wanna have a little bit of a plan. Um, but also remind yourself that you could be spontaneous. People want to see that you're genuine. People want to see, and, and actually that's why I like Facebook Live because there's a lot of applications for very nice fine-tuned video, very nicely edited video. However, I find that it's less pressure on me to be able to do a Facebook Live. I could be genuine and people, when they meet me or something, they're like, oh, you're kind of just like your Facebook Live. I'm like, yeah, that's me, you know? Um, so remind yourself that there's less expectation of perfection. So you don't have to worry about, you know, if you do a video that's not Facebook Live, you may do five or six takes. It's a lot less of an, ex there's a lot less of an expectation. Just be genuine. So that's number two. Number three would be, feel, definitely do some sort of pre-Facebook Live, like advertising, right? So what a lot of times what I'll do is I'll say, you know, anticipate, you know, we have a Facebook Live virtual open house at 123 Main Street at this day and time. And that, you know, kind of helps generate some activity and some interest. Um, and that also, you know, it, when you set yourself up and you say, I'm going to do it in this day and time, people may kind of come back to expect you to do it. So that will drive you to do it as well. Because if you don't end up going live that day and time, they'll be like, what happened? Is Alexa sick? Like, what's going on? So that's right. a cool, that's a cool tactic as well. Uh, number four, try to consider including other people, maybe like an interview style like we're doing right now. Yeah. Perfect, you know, because it's more conversational and it's natural and it's not relying on one person to do the talking. And, you know, I find that people really enjoy that. And in fact, not only do I recommend doing that for yourself because it'll help you get out and, you know, feel more comfortable with it. But once you're kind of into it more and more, when you bring in other vendors or maybe you want to interview a local coffee shop, like you're helping other people, bless you, you're helping other people step out of their comfort zone, right? That's our theme. And they'll appreciate that so much. And that deepens the relationship that you have with this particular vendor or whatever. And not to mention the fact that when you include someone else, you tag them and it goes out to all their database as well. So it's a super win, 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 win. And then my fifth, my fifth recommendation would be, and I know I showed you guys this before, but this is my mobilizer, DJI Osmo. It's a mobile, whatever. Stabilizer. Setting. Exactly. Yeah. I'm not, I'm no pro. Like I just know what to use because I ask people. So that's going to help you as well, because if you're going to be doing some sort of like touring or anything like that, having the stabilizer is much better than having the phone like this. Right. So those are my little tips. Yeah. And I will say just one final thing on, on the Facebook live that it's authentic. You know, like like you were saying, you make mistakes. We're all real people and people like, know, and trust you. They're going to do business with you. And the Alexa you meet on video today will be the same Alexa you meet in person. And they love that. They don't like, you know, I think generations past, it was, there was this professional, you know, facade almost. And then there was the real people behind the scenes when they weren't working. And right. I don't think there should be a distinction anymore. It's we are who we are. And that's why people yeah, are going to do business with us. You know what? People uh, like you or not. You know what I mean? So that's it. And by the way, I just I need to add one more thing is that it has 
drastically changed my business as far as being top of mind. No, I have not yet to date sold a home based on my Facebook Live virtual open house. However, what I have done is sold people to you wanting to use me when they make the move. And just being top of mind, they're like, wow, yours is so cutting edge, <laughs> you know, and no one else is really doing it. So, I mean, it's really, really worth the time. Just, just do it, you know? Just do it. Make your dreams come true. Nike, just do it. So let's, uh, let's get into the crumbling foundations as we get towards the end here. So I was surprised when we were talking offline. <clears throat> you know, I think of Connecticut, I think, you know, if, if you can't afford to live here, you, you know, if you don't live here already, you can't afford to live here. I feel like if somebody sent me a sign one time of like they're passing in Connecticut and said that, but you have this problem in your area or challenge, temporary challenge about crumbling foundations, right? It's not, yeah. we're talking literally, not, not figuratively, right? Yeah. So it's, it's a, it's a, sh I mean, it's a challenge, like you said, and it's a challenge that none of us ever thought we'd have to deal with at all. I mean, who would think a crumbling foundation? So first and foremost, I'm going to say that I'm not an expert. I'm not licensed to say anything about anything, but I'm going to tell you what I know. <laughs> so it's an issue where, you know, as we know, foundation materials comes from concrete, which comes from, you know, a quarry. And as we also know from the study of geology, the study of rocks, <laughs> that there's different veins um, uh, uh, and elements that essentially make up, you know, the, the rock and the earth below us. So apparently there's this vein that streams all the way from like Choice Rivieras, Quebec, like Canada area, um, who had this problem already, all the way down to like Pennsylvania. So again, this information deep reliable, but not guaranteed. <laughs> this is what I've been told. <laughs> <laughs> so this pyrotite material that's actually in that's an aggregate in our foundations or many foundations to be determined how many when it is exposed to an, enough amount of water what it does is it it expands and contracts essentially and kind of creating like spider like um, cracks in the foundation horizontal grid like cracks like if someone took a baseball bat and smashed your windshield kind of cracks. So wow. it's kind of nuts. It's really nuts. And it's really sad too, because for the average, you know, homeowner to do such a repair to date, the only the only repair that's known is total replacement that actually works. So what that includes is actually them raising the home, demoing the foundation, or putting another foundation in another part of the property. And then after the foundation cures, what is like what, 30 days or so? You uh, put the, found, the home back down, the foundation, book up all the utilities, et cetera. So anyways, needless to say, with the median sale price of a home up 265 in Greater Hartford, it certainly is a big issue, you know? Um, we don't know how big this will be. We don't know how many homes will be affected, but it's certainly kind of curved, uh, throwing a curveball, not only to us realtors, but all these poor homeowners, you know? I mean, that's the biggest fear is ever potentially getting someone into one of these homes. So again, I mean, I'm not an expert, but we try to get the experts involved. We get, you know, the engineer in, concrete engineer, structural engineer to make sure they do proper investigation and whatnot. And in fact, I've served on the CTR Crumbling Foundations work group, the Connecticut Association of Realtors work group, where we kind of discuss this issue, you know, various brokers and whatnot, we all get together you know, because we want to try to make as great of an impact as possible and try to help these homeowners. So actually something that's been passed recently on the seat level is that every single home insurance policy will be added $1 per month. So that's 12 extra dollars that goes to this pool where we can hope, hopefully help a few people uh, that, you know, have this issue. Um, but it's definitely something that it's a, it's a challenge, but just like anything else, we can overcome it. You know, we're working through our bubble currently. In Connecticut, we're still working through our foreclosure inventory. There is a huge opportunity still to purchase in Connecticut. And, um, you know, we're working up there. You know, we're getting through the distressed properties. And this definitely will perhaps create a second pool of distressed inventory. But we'll get through it like anything else. What's the cost to cure, roughly, would you say? Like 100, 150000 or something like that? Yeah, the quotes I've seen have been anywhere from 150000 for, like, your typical 1,200-square-foot ranch to 250,000. It just totally depends. 
So if you do the math, I mean, the median sale price of a home, 265 or so. I mean, of course, it depends on the town, but it's definitely, it's definitely a challenge, no doubt. Well, it's good to see that you're taking that challenge head on. And, you know, when I talked to you about it, you were like, eh, yeah, Crumb Lake Foundation. It's like, mm, yeah, like peeling paint. It was like, you know, <laughs> We'll get through it, and it's. Uh, what else can we do? You know. Right. I mean, it's it's something that's there. You just gotta adapt and overcome, like you've said, throughout the the broadcast here. So we're getting to the end. We always like to include, you know, last bit of if you were talking to the young Alexa who just graduated and was getting going to get into real estate, and you could give her some advice based on the experience, the knowledge, the expertise that you've gained over the years that you've been in real estate. What would you tell her and or just a new real estate agent getting started in real estate? So I would tell her to network and not do not be afraid to network and to also make those relationships with key people outside of your industry. Kind of get out of your real estate bubble. Um, you know, I remember the first two years I put my head down and I legit grind 24 seven. And I looking back, I'm like, wow, like, I'm happy my husband's still with me, you know, and he wasn't my husband at the time. He was my boyfriend, but you know, nights and weekends, it's a lot. Um, you definitely have to, you know, have balance in your life, you know, and I find, I, I've found that by making these key relationships outside of the real estate industry has really helped my business. In fact, I'm part of a BNI business networking international 30, 36% of my business last year was strictly from BNI. I partnered with strategic partners, not only lenders and, 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 you know, specific real estate attorneys, but much, much further than that. You know, I, I have networks with, um, you know, family law attorneys. So anytime someone's going through a divorce, you know, in addition to estate planning attorneys, that's a huge one as well. Um, so kind of really just get out of your real estate bubble network. There's a huge world out there. Um, and that's really helped me spend my time more efficiently. You know, I meet with these people once a week, you know, and really, really learn a lot from them. And we share referrals and it's been really huge for me in my business. And then also by having that network, it ensures that anytime my client is looking for any type of connection, more likely than not, I have that connection for them. So yeah. guess what? They always think of me whenever they need anything. <laughs> and that way I know to think of me when they're looking to make a move. So that's one piece of advice. Let's see what else can I give? Oh, always, always, always focus on yourself as far as taking care of yourself first right so if you like i remember the first few years just like non-stop like on the road like leave that leave the house in the morning and be out 24 7 like that's cool and all but then i wasn't really taking care of myself you know and i realized i'm like oh my gosh like i need to like you know you need to make sure that you're you know feeding your brain the good stuff you know you want to make sure you're reading and all that and i heard judy mention that i do the same thing it's the miracle morning for real estate agents when I realized that I was running around and I realized I needed to kind of center myself and take control of my day. So the first thing I did was, unfortunately, I had to wake up at 4.30 a.m. to start making this work for me, you know, before their office is open. But what I found was if you're able to exercise, read, meditate, pray, whatever you do, have a routine, then the rest will fall into place. And believe it or not, that will help you to better serve your clients. You're refreshed. And you'll, you will have a better quality life. That's really the goal. And last but not least, to that same point, I remember someone would call, like, I need this, that, or the other. Like, you got it. What time? Now I ask my clients, can you please provide me with a few days and times? And then I kind of work it into what works best for my schedule. Being more efficient is where it's at, a thousand percent. Well, thank you so much, Alexa, taking well, time out of your busy day. We really appreciate it. So if you... You're looking for a go-to agent in Connecticut and you don't have one yet. We have one here. Hold on. It's reversed. Okay. This way. That one right there. <laughs> Damien, thank you so much for doing this. I really appreciate, you know, you doing this for all this real tours and all the new agents coming to the marketplace. I think it's awesome. And for all Thanks. the old agents, I love watching the other episodes. You can always learn something new. Thank you. Have a great day and continue success in 2018. Cheers. Cheers.